thank you, India Foundation. Uh, this is a very challenging uh, session to moderate. It's a privilege, in fact, for me to speak on this. I noticed that the focus of today's uh, discussion is a slew of new technologies from, uh, uh, from cryptocurrencies, dark web, cognitive networks, terror financing, and financial fraud. So we are happy to announce that we have a, a very distinguished panel. We're going to be speaking on this. I just like to make a few words. Uh, we find, I find that technology always outpaces legislation. So whatever, whatever we do, our lawmaking processes are two or three steps behind technology. This we have seen in the case of cryptocurrency where most countries are finding it hard to regulate. Uh, this is, again happens is in, in controlling the dark web because uh, as, yes, as yesterday's speaker uh, pointed out, the, the differences between the deep web and the dark web is such getting into the dark web is, uh, is a matter that uh, is <clears throat> well, technologically does require some skills and it is, a, it is a wild west sort of thing in cyberspace. Nobody knows how to control it. And, and therefore it is being misused for a lot of, uh, a lot of criminal activities being trading in, trading in uh, drugs or whatever, and sometimes cryptocurrency they're being done on that, despite the fact that cryptocurrencies actually have a, a fairly good ledger system like the blockchain. But due to the fact that uh, there is very little legislation about it, uh, we find that, uh, we, we, we find that, we find that, uh, uh, it is often being misused. Though, uh, though, as I said, per se, we cannot call any technology dangerous, except that we don't have sometimes the controls in space place for that. This again goes for cognitive networks, which in effect are uh, networks which can direct uh, this, the direct traffic to various, uh, uh, to direct traffic in various ways. Now this, uh, while it would be of great beneficial effect, can also create problems like uh, um, stalling infrastructure, stalling uh, transportation and so on. All these things like financial fraud, again, the, the methods that have been used for easy transference of money, for digital transference of money, which can help uh, innumerable uh, people who are otherwise not uh, connected to or regular banking systems uh, is open to being manipulated by fraud. So I can only say one thing, this is a, this is a huge challenge, but the positive note I would like to uh, add that where technology is concerned, the good always, always outweighs the bad. And then this positive note, I'd like to start up uh, on, the, on the session. And uh, I'd invite my first speaker. Uh, <clears throat> I, I just want just a minute. I'm trying to get the bio of the speakers. Just a minute, please. Because I mean, they, they, the speakers are also, uh, they're all such luminaries in their field. I would like to give a proper. <clears throat> Only one minute. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Raitan Azani. He, direct, he currently serves as the Director of Research uh, at the Institute of uh, Counterterrorism ICT and uh, the head of the BA and MA specialization in counterterrorism and homeland security. I mean, I can't think of a better person to speak on this at the Lander School of Government, Diplomacy and Strategy at the Inter Interdisciplinary Center at uh, Herzliya in Israel. He is a colonel at the uh, Israel Defense Forces, so I think has uh, an on-hand uh, knowledge of the subject that he's going to speak about. Uh, Dr. Aitana Zani, please. Thank you very much. I want to share uh, my presentation. Okay, you can see my presentation, yes? Yes. Okay, and you can hear me also? Yes. <laughs> okay, th thank you very much, TV, for your help. And I want to uh, discuss uh, during my presentation some of the topics that connected to the cryptocurrency issues. And uh, to start with the uh, an overall descriptions of the situations on the ground. 
because we know that since 9-11, United States launched a counterterrorism campaign uh, with some of the international uh, you know, institution that were with this, this campaign, that in United States, they titled this campaign as a war on terror. This was the idea uh, behind the campaign. And one of the important parts of this war on terror was the counter-terror financing campaign. So since 9-11, we find out uh, it changes within the uh, uh, a jihadi group, the global jihadists that are were influenced from this kind, kind of uh, campaign. The strategy of United States changed dramatically also the course of the evaluation of the global uh, a terror organization like Al-Qaeda, that it, until then they were a centralized organization, since then they became a decentralized organization. And when you are a decentralized organization, it influences everything that you are doing as an organization and you use a different tools to deal with your day-to-day uh, -day operation, financing operation, and so on. These organizations like Al-Qaeda and afterwards in 2015, uh, ISIS and others, were ve work very hard to survive. To, uh, if you want to survive, you need to be able to be flexible, to be adaptive, and to have uh, the ability to uh, enter into new arena using uh, a, the new circumstances to uh, a continue a, your a operation. So what we can say that in, ge in generally, these groups, the global jihadists were influenced by the uh, international uh, uh, a system or international counter financing uh, uh, operation. They pushed out from the international banking system that they were there uh, the majority of the 90s. And they, because the regulation, because trial, because legislation, because a lot of things and uh, a war a of the countering terror financing was also in the uh, a court system in United States and in other places though. So they need to find out uh, a different uh, areas of operation. One of the things that they did, they go back to the past, meaning they use the traditional channel to bring money to their organization, like they go back to the Hawala system, they go back to criminal activities, uh, and they changed uh, some of their uh, modus operandi. The next uh, a problem that this uh, uh, international campaign caused it's uh, uh, every component of this organization, meaning every jihadi front, establish its own new uh, a, a financing system. Now, until 9-11, you need to act against one financing system that are centralized. After 9-11, you need to deal with a lot of uh, a financing system uh, headed by a local uh, uh, leaders in different areas around the world. AQIP, AQIP has their own uh, uh, financing system. AQIM has their own financing system. Al-Qaeda in Iraq has its own financing system, meaning you need to learn and to understand what are these uh, systems that are uh, operating uh, on the ground. The most important changes within this field was the development of new technologies. When the development of new, new technologies in the 21st century started, jihadi groups, terrorist organization enter into this arena. This is the social network, this is the digital currency, this is the, uh, what we call the encrypted applications and the darknet. It enabled them and give them a leeway to deal with their uh, financing system during uh, through all these uh, uh, component, and it enabled them also to bypass some of the counter financing campaign that was uh, carried out against this organization. But lately, and I'm very happy to see that it was uh, published also in 2020. United States government seized, uh, you know, a large amount of crypto uh, a currency uh, a, that was uh, around 300 account that used by Hamas, that used by Al-Qaeda, and that used by ISIS. 
meaning uh, these kind of operation, we see that there are a lot of efforts today to deal with all these components of the system itself. And trying to go and to see what are we are dealing with, you have here in one slide, you have here in one slide, all the financing system sources, channel, storage and management and client. Meaning to understand from the beginning, from the topics of the sources, how they generate money. Here is the places that they generate money. And there are differences within these sources from external sources and internal sources. We saw this development during the Islamic uh, uh, Caliphate that they based on more on internal sources than external one. And then you will have the channels themselves. When you generate money within these sources, it go to the channels. So the old one or the traditional one was banks, hawala, cash couriers. But during the years and the technology, we enter into Western Union, PayPal, prepaid uh, a card and cryptocurrency meaning there are a changes of the technology that enable them to change their channels of uh, delivering the money. Regarding the storage and the management, it go from uh, a bank account and Hawala system to Bitcoin wallet, meaning they need to change also the storage system and the ability to deal with this uh, a component of the uh, storage uh, system. When they enter into the uh, a cryptocurrency arenas, one of the things that they must have within their uh, a system is cryptocurrency exchange. Why? Because you cannot deliver a cryptocurrency, uh, let's say for instance, a Bitcoin to somebody that he is operated in a remote area and he don't have an ability to have uh, to change this Bitcoin into fiat money. So they need to deal with this kind of phenomenon of the cryptocurrency exchanges. And this became one of the weak points of the system because you can analyze, you can gather intelligence on these uh, uh, cryptocurrency exchanges and deal with these issues. The last component, these are what we called end users. At the end of the day, you gather money to deliver this money to your end user. And end user, it's not only the jihadists themselves, it's also all the things around uh, the jihadists, family members, social sectors, and uh, you need all these uh, uh, money for operation, recruitment, salaries, and procurement. This is in general how the system uh, work. And I want to take you another level to see what happened within the new generations of using uh, a financing uh, a system in the time of what we had uh, these cryptocurrency capabilities. So the first step is here. Today, every jihadi group that want to uh, bring money to carry out uh, a, these kinds of uh, generating donation need to go to a financing campaign. You need to start with the financing campaign. You need to promote the idea that you need money for your support. You need money for your operations. And one of the things that you do it, you do it openly because you need it for the crowd. You need it for your uh, a source of uh, money. You need to do it openly, but at the same time to be secret regarding the channels that you send the money through your, uh, uh, to your uh, uh, groups, uh, to your uh, uh, end users. And you need to bring the ability or to make people feel that what they are doing is very secure because it's anonymous, nobody can enter into your Bitcoin wallet. It's something that will not be traceable. So you need to build them, bring them into this process of everything is secure. So in one hand, you publish it on your website that people can, uh, or on your social networks that people can read it because you want to reach the masses. On the other hand, you give them an ability to think that this is very secure. Okay, so why? Because you open for them a communication channel. 
not only the Bitcoin wallet, communication channels via uh, the internet through other uh, components. So we start with the crowd or donors. These are the target for generating the money. They have the Bitcoin wallet. And now you have three different options. One, the terror organization published the Bitcoin wallet. So it's very clear that this Bitcoin wallet belong to a terror organization or the terror organization want to operate under the gray zone and there are charities or DAWA centers that are connected, not openly, discreetly. They are connected to the terror organization, but they publish it uh, openly through the crowd because they want, you know, some kind of uh, money that will be contribute to this organization. So when you understand this system, how the system is work, what you need is intelligence uh, investigation to understand who are the people, the donors, uh, and to find out if when they donated the money, they know that this is for terror organization. To understand what we have in the Bitcoin wallet, if, if uh, this Bitcoin wallet is already, uh, a, somebody uh, designated this Bitcoin wallet as the Bitcoin wallet of a terror organization. To have investigations on charities or on our centers to see if they are connected, meaning, Part of the information that you can gather from this system to understand that there are uh, these uh, uh, a financing campaign is a financing campaign of a terror organization. You can do it in from the open sources, or if you have a problems, uh, you need uh, intelligence investigation that shows that these charities are connected. To the terror organization. This is uh, one uh, component of the system. Just see some examples. During the 21st century, we saw a lot of examples of uh, a financing system. Here is one of the fundraising campaign from 2010. You see the name of the campaign is Equiptas. In Arabic, they called it Jahizuna. It was not, it was public part of it on a website, part of it, it was public on the uh, a jihadi forums, and but they couldn't reach the masses because it was a very uh, a small group that were connected to this uh, a topic. So it was developed during the years, and you see here a different way of uh, a carried out uh, a financing campaign. This is the financing campaign of Al Qaeda, Jabhat and Nusra. Is running on the Twitter account. Is running through uh, a Telegram account. They give you a connection. You can call us. The same uh, concept you see here with ISIS in 2018. Uh, a campaign for financing running through a different uh, a channels, uh, a Twitter, Facebook, and others, and also Salafists from Gaza. Everybody within the global jihadist groups and even the local jihadist groups understood that this is uh, very important for them uh, uh, to bring money to their organization and they use this uh, uh, system. On the other hand, you see another example that they publish directly numbers of accounts that they want you to, uh, uh, numbers of uh, uh, telephones or telegram account that they ask you to contact them. On the first things, they publish it to the open. On the other thing, they want, you say you want to contribute, please contact us and we tell you exactly to what channel you need to contribute uh, uh, your money. When it uh, developed more during uh, uh, these years, we see uh, the Islamic State using uh, and publishing a digital wallet number. Here it is, the digital wallet number, uh, the Bitcoin address. But this time, this Bitcoin address published on the dark web, meaning they also have through the dark web an ability to publish Bitcoin address. And on the other side, uh, another example from the ISIS, but this time is from one of the ISIS financiers and uh, a keynote. This is a, a guy called Abu Hussein El Brittany that published on his uh, a Twitter account the numbers of the Bitcoin wallet asking for donation. This is things that you need to understand regarding ISIS. It's not that only the central uh, command 
of ISIS, the headquarters were involved in fundraising event. Every uh, keynote in ISIS were involved in this kind of uh, operation. And when it become even more uh, uh, complicated and people understand that they can make money from using these uh, Bitcoin addresses, you see here three different campaigns, two uh, campaigns that connected to Al Qaeda. One of them at least promoted the idea, you contribute your money for our uh, jihad. The second is connected to, you contribute your money for the Ramadan issues from uh, supporting the needies. And uh, uh, on the other side, this is the Hamas uh, uh, component uh, that said we need this money for our operation. So if I'm, I zoom in inside this uh, uh, information, you see they ask them to donate anonymously and secretly with Bitcoin. Meaning they told their audience that what if you donate money through Bitcoin is very anonymous, is very secret. So please donate us money and they gave them, gave them the Bitcoin account. You see here in all these places, the Bitcoin account. And in some places they gave them also uh, an ability to connect to their uh, organization. You see the same system uh, by Hayat Tahrir Sham in July 2020, meaning this uh, a continuous ability. And you see also uh, a, a, the system, how the system works, let's say, for instance, in a case study that we can analyze all the information of this case study from the open sources intelligence like uh, a, a terror organization in Gaza that called the Popular Resistance Committee, published in Facebook, in Telegram, in Twitter, the number of a Bitcoin wallet, here it is in all the places, the number of the Bitcoin wallet, and ask people to donate money to this organization. So when you start to investigate uh, this Bitcoin wallet, you find out that this Bitcoin wallet is running uh, a, a, in uh, a one of the uh, uh, companies in, uh, a, by one of the companies in Gaza. His Bitcoin wallet that 100% connected to the uh, a jihadi organization. And the, also it's a Bitcoin wallet. I need to finish. So I can continue if I understand you correct? No, you don't have... Uh, uh, yes, you can continue, sir. Okay. Please continue for five minutes. Okay, I will finish within two minutes. It's okay. So what we have here, uh, investigation through the blockchain to show what happened within this Bitcoin wallet. And then uh, the investigation continued by our uh, uh, senior researchers and find out a connection to a company that called Muhammad El Kur Trading Company that has a website that the only Bitcoin wallet on this website, this was the Bitcoin wallet of this jihadi group meaning you can find in one place all these components working together in one place. This is the reason why I'm saying that you need an investigation, an in-depth investigation that enable you to link the wallet to the terrorist organization. But it's not the only thing. The most, in my view, one of the most important things is, is to find out what is the connections of this website okay, that was a website that served uh, a jihadi group with other Bitcoin exchange around the world, like uh, exchange, a uh, Binance exchange and others. So to uh, the designation process of a Bitcoin account could cut, can cut the links between these groups of cash uh, uh, for PS to another international uh, uh, Bitcoin exchange uh, uh, around the world. And to end uh, uh, my discussions, uh, I want to uh, uh, describe even a problematic, a more problematic system. And why I'm saying more problematic system, it's easy 
to analyze information when you have somebody from outside the organization deliver money through Bitcoin wallet to the organization itself, then to analyze information, what's happened inside the terror organization between the management and the end user. And when we are talking about this uh, uh, component, you can find out that the discussion between them are running through the darknet. Okay, so it's very difficult to find these kinds of connections. So if you are a Bitcoin user, it's not a problem for the organization because they deliver you money through a Bitcoin, through a Bitcoin wallet. You can be a criminal and you can operate in the digital break market and you pay with Bitcoin from, uh, you know, from buying drones, from buying weapons and all these kinds of issues. But if you are a fiat user, they need a Bitcoin transfer office. So now they need an investigation. Who is this Bitcoin transfer office? Who is the fiat users? What the terror organization want to do with this? One of the things that uh, I saw uh, during the last uh, uh, month, this is, uh, let's say for instance, an example of Al Qaeda Bitcoin transfer center in Idlib, that these are the link between what we said organization and the end user. It's in Idlib. They said very very openly to the people, you can send to us any cryptocurrencies that you want. We will find the, uh, the uh, way to translate it, transfer it into fiat money. So if you want to see how the system works, you need to search uh, uh, through this uh, uh, component. And with this, thank you very much. I I finished my presentation. I'm sorry that I took some minutes from my uh, other friend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Asani. That was a very illuminating talk. And you have uh, summarized the way terrorists would be able to use Bitcoins and other forms of cyber, uh, uh, cyber currency for uh, illegal purposes. Now I request my our next speaker, Mr. Krishna Shastri, to please speak. Uh, Mr. Krishna Shastri, ladies and gentlemen, is a partner in the cybersecurity uh, in the Ernst & Young in India. His prior experience, which is for more than 25 years, has handled a large number of cyber investigations of national and international importance. His core area of expertise includes offline and online digital forensic investigations, cybersecurity breaches, uh, and incident response management, malware analysis, and e-discovery. Um, please, Dr. Krishna Shastri, we are waiting. Uh, good morning, Dr. Prabha, and uh, good morning to all the participants. So I hope I'm audible. You're able to listen to my voice? Yes. Right. Uh, thank you, Ajni, for uh, giving an excellent presentation about uh, how the Bitcoin wallets are used by the terrorist organizations. But my focus is into more different directions where how the remember the hackers, etc., are using the dark web for the case of cyber attacks, especially in the financial systems and how they're able to loot a big amount of money. And in most of the cases, the money is going and landing into the hands of the drug cartels, the money laundering people, etc. So who is behind their network is the one question I'm going to answer here. So it is not just the case of Roomberg purchasing the drugs, purchasing the illegal weapons, etc., on the dark web, but it's more concentrating towards what really is going in the dark web as well as the cyber security incidents are happening here. So all the views expressed here are my pure personal based on the investigations I've carried out, especially the advanced persistent threat attacks that was targeted against the banking and the national critical information infrastructures for the last one decade when I moved from the government to the private industry. So I'll set the context really what the industry is really bleeding it. And what are the various trends we are observing the attacks and who is really behind these attacks? Is it a money launderer? Is it remember like drug cartels or is it a terrorist organizations? How they were all interwoven together for this type of attacks. Mm -hmm. And one case study I'm going to discuss about, which is generally rated as the blackest day in the Indian history of the banking where one bank got attacked by the cyber attackers and they lost approximately 10.5 million US dollars because they attack on their cyber systems. And as on date, we are clueless exactly where the money went and laundered and who are the people involved in that. 
how the hackers have really used the dark web for the purpose of reverse this criminal activity and what is the ultimate need of the hour as you are all aware today starting from terrorist organizations to money launderers to drug cartels have realized the banks are the place where once the distribution is happened is a lot of money is available where you can hack it and you can transfer the money so look at the case of the bangladesh breach where it has happened they are supposed to lose fortunately something around 950 million us dollars but they lost only 81 million us dollars starting through some of the banks here what i mentioned which are all reported in the public domain so today hackers and who is behind the hackers i will try to show you in the next couple of slides it is not that just the banking and the financial institutions today even the it organizations insurance companies pharma companies you talk it any one ultimately they are all going to hack the computer systems for the purpose of ransomware infections so they made the ransomware they asked the client to provide me the pay the money in the form of bitcoins if they are not in a position to pay the bitcoins they are keeping the data somewhere in the dark web etc so that is where the third attacks are happening it is exclusively the case of the data breaches when the data privacy laws have become very stringent in the whole world and regulatory and privacy concerns are the one which are really creating a big havoc for every organization every country so that is where hackers are using remember a internet for the purpose of money but in all these cases where the attack happens where the victim is supposed to pay the ultimate point is converting that money all in the form of a virtual currency it may be bitcoin it may be ethereum we call it as any variety of the virtual currency the hackers are asking for this but who is really present behind this i have seen it almost the eight shift systems attack that has rocked the entire world and who is really present behind the attacks on the banking systems the mind finally money is going and landing in the drug cartels in somewhere in remember southern america somewhere in southeast asia if you talk about remember into the casinos why the casinos are involved how the drug cartels are involved that we will understand in the next few couple of slides so what is the first trend i observed if you look at is cyber crime has become a service so we'll try to call it as a completely saas so entire supply chain management has happened drug cartels terrorist organizations money launderers are hiding the hackers hackers are hacking the banks and transferring the money and for every remember 10 million us dollars that transferred they are going to get their pie so this is the first trend we are observing it so cyber crime has become a completely matured industry today with a perfect supply chain management gone are the days where is a small individual sir used to be there if you compare the skill and the focuses today we found the high skill and high focused people that is a advanced persistent threat attacks will try to call they are the real people who are involved in this all this major cyber attacks targeting the financial system systems of the countries so they are targeting mainly three things one is the financial systems the shift servers of the banks where you can transfer millions of dollars at a stroke or it may be the atm systems where the money can be looted from more than 30 40 countries at a single span of minute and data breaches is another places where they are exfiltrating the data then they are asking the money in the form of remember ransom and third if you look at is the most important is the ransomware breaches and the fourth is which is really causing more damage if you look at is based on the iot systems were implemented something called ransom based distributed denial of service attacks where the websites are getting down the hackers are sending a mail saying pay me this much amount of bitcoins so we will provide you a solution for this type of attack today for all major cyber attacks that is happening the ultimate source is only the virtual currency that's where the real problem we are facing it and you are all looking dark web only for the purpose of one thing is the drug was sold is the drug was purchased is remember any weapon was purchased but today what we are finding is internet has remember especially the dark web has become a very very big hub where people are selling the malicious codes the malwares are getting sold for every 1 minute 83 new malwares are getting appear in the dark web is a new trend and per day more than 7 lakhs new malwares are coming and entering to the dark web is a new trend we are observing it so that's where they are selling the exploits how to breach into the computer system what vulnerabilities that are available and what are the root kits that are available to penetrate into the operating system is a new trend they are selling it and everything and anything you want to purchase the only option here it is nothing but in the form of virtual currencies 
it is not just the law enforcement agencies or the security researchers who are using artificial intelligence and machine learning. Remember, these people who are behind this remember dark web are also using the artificial intelligence and machine learning. Based on that, the malwares are getting developed. Out of 83 malicious codes that is coming for every minute on the dark web, 70% could not be detected by the existing technologies. And they are investing a big amount of money also in the form of R&D research and development. So these are some of the new trends that are really coming here it is. And to what extent people will try to call ransomware as a malicious program which will encrypt the data. But I would like to call ransomware is a new word called as a revenue generation malware. Today the nations are present behind it. Countries having a very poor foreign remember exchange reserves. They are encouraging their to hack into the computer systems of other countries. Shastriji, we are not able to hear you. ransomware attack has happened it today this is what the new trend we are observing it bitcoin price variations linked to the ransomware attack that is how remember they are able to make a very good amount of money let me tell you one case you'll understand how the dark web i told you this is called as the darkest remember day in the indian banking sector where on the 11th august 2018 one of the indian bank atm systems got impacted and we lost in a span of 120 minutes that is in two hours approximately 10.5 million us dollars money has been withdrawn in 25 countries and as our date we have no clue exactly who are the persons behind that who funded these people is it a nation or a terrorist organization or a money launderer or a drug cartel no one knows about it and if you start looking the attack also even though major attack has happened on the 11th august 2018 the actual incident started sometime around September 2017. You can think of the hackers are taking approximately nine months to stay in your computer system. They're getting, remember, the funding from different organizations to hack it to transfer the money. From September 2017, a phishing mail that was sent to one of the employees who clicked that mail, through that mail, the whole bank got compromised. And on 21st July 2018, approximately, remember, 11 months from the source of attack, the entire bank ATM system was under the control of the hackers. Then the real dark web activity has happened. In the dark web activity, the global remember hackers have started selling the card numbers. And these cards numbers were sold and purchased in more than 25 countries. And it was numbers were distributed to the local people who converted that numbers into physical cards and again distributed in a local gray market in the form of a mules. And when all this activity is happening in dark web, we are not in a position to understand it. Who is really behind that? What was the attack source from where the attacker has come in? Now today, the dark web has become a very good media for remember targeting the, especially the banking and finance industries, in addition to just selling certain things on the dark web. Look at what was the modus operandi. It is not just one bank. The entire world is getting bleeding because of this type of cyber attacks. They compromise only one machine in the whole network. Let it be banking, let it be the defense sector, let it be remember space sector. From there, they are laterally moving and harvesting the whole intelligence in the network. And ultimately, remember, they are going to cause the damage depending upon this. Look at the case of, remember, the Iran cyber attack that has happened against their nuclear reactors to the latest breach that has got reported in any part of the world. And who is the real person who is getting funded? Is it a rogue nation or is it a terrorist organization? It's very difficult to prove it. But the ultimate source where the money is moving from one place to another place is only in the form of a bitcoins. Based on the tactics, tools, procedures they are adopting to hack into the computer systems, yes, we have identified who could be the threat actors. It is not gone out of the days where some 15 years boy, an image should hacker is trying to enter into the computer system. Uh, today, it is a professional hackers having a very good link with the terrorist organizations and the money launderers who are the real persons here it is. It may be a rogue nation who is supporting them in the form of a funding. That you have to look at into major. 
there are certain nations who are hiring the hackers to hack into the computer system. They are providing the money to the terrorist organization. That link is the most important. So based on the tactics, tools, procedures, the hackers are using it. We are able to identify what are the various groups and which part of the world they are really available. That's where the complete classification has been done. Like you have mentioned about using a very good data mining techniques, using clustering and linkages, you are able to pinpoint and identify that. What was the probable IP address from source where they are trying to attack it? So what is my closing thoughts? Remember it is. The first and the foremost is where we are lagging is the information sharing it. We are doing nuts and bolts. In reality, the information sharing is missing from one country to another country. Who are the real hacking groups who are trying to target the remember the banking systems from where to where the money is getting flown? And please remember and what form the money is getting flown. That is where we are completely information sharing is missing. So what is the need of the hour if you look at is information sharing of the tactics, tools, procedures these people are adopting is the need of the hour that is most important. Second is enhancing the capability. All countries does not have the same set of tools. The extent, remember, your country may be having, may not have, remember, in the same the set of tools here it is. So information sharing to investigation to forensic capabilities, gathering the evidence properly is the most important thing that is really not present today. So the need of the hour is sharing information and increasing the capability of one country to the other country because the threat may be present from every country today. If you are trained, you can investigate yourself, doesn't matter for us. But certain countries where you don't have a lack of attention, you try and remember police officials and the forensic scientists or the information security personnel, the threat is also going to pose for you. The most important is investigation to forensic capabilities, collecting the evidence at the right time. That is where the need of the hour is important. Today, we may have some capabilities in a reactive capabilities, but what we are looking is not reactive, moving from reactive to proactive to predictive. So how can we move from reactive to proactive to predictive? How can we increase our capabilities? The most important need of our what we are looking for. It is. Third, can't we have a very good remember global open source threat intelligence platform where the IP addresses, where the hacker groups, the Bitcoin remember accounts where it is getting moving from one place to another place. When currency has become converted into a global currency due to these virtual currencies, why can't we have a global threat intelligence platforms where we can share this information from which wallet to which wallet the money is flowing, from which IP address to which IP address money is getting transmitted. If you are having that, remember, certainly we can solve this issue to a great extent. So the most important need of the hour, what we try to look at is how can you build remember, together a global open source threat intelligence platform is the most important thing. And again, with the law enforcement capabilities, creation of a phone, <coughs> phony websites, fake websites, luring the people so that they will come and think it is the actual wallet and they try to transfer the money, identifying what was IP address from where they are transferring the money. So far, good attempt not been done by Mirmambar in many other countries. That is where if you are having a very good helping hand, how can you create a phony website and how can you create a very good honey pots to track and trace the people who are using virtual currency for the illegal activities, the most important. Last but not the least, the regulation of the crypto exchanges is the most important. So there are certain countries where it is illegal. There are certain countries which is Ill remember legal. So what is the need of our is to have remember come to a single platform internationally and how can we control these crypto exchanges and based on the crypto exchanges data, how can you do remember a data mining and doing a very good clustering and linkage analysis to identify the linkage that is happening from one place to another place is the most important task. So these are my viewpoints. I'm open for any questions based on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. This was a, a very educated, it was a stupendous speech. You have highlighted the problems that we are all facing, highlighted the problems that our uh, security agencies and our intelligence agencies need to hone up on uh, skills to understand where our danger lies. And you have uh, uh, brought out the immediate need for a global, uh, global uh, platform, threat, threat perception platform to uh, where we could all cooperate on this. 
this perhaps would be a very good thing between India and Israel if we could start off on uh, this matter since I think both of us have some, both our countries have some, uh, uh, we have some kind of uh, technological expertise on this. And uh, as I said, it has been a very educative experience for all our viewers. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Shastri. I now uh, request Mr. Madan Oberoi for, to give us the next uh, talk. Mr. Madan Oberoi uh, is a very celebrated police officer. He's the director of cyber innovation and outreach at Interpol in Singapore. This is his second round in Singapore. So he is uh, very well aware of uh, financial frauds about, uh, about the use and misuse of Bitcoins. Uh, he's incidentally a, one of the, what one would call the extremely educated police officers. He's a Fulbright scholar in the area of, cyber, in the area of cybersecurity and holds a PhD uh, in the subject from uh, the Indian Institute of Technology in Delhi. He's currently, he, Mr. Ober, Dr. Oberoi is currently supervising two directories, including what is called the Cyber Strategy and Outreach Subdirectorate and the uh, Cyber Research and Innovation Directorate in Singapore at Interpol. Uh, over to you, Dr. Oberoi. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the kind words and also for giving me the opportunity. I would also like to thank Krishna Shastri for setting the uh, context in which I can make my uh, comments. And uh, I'll start from where he ended in his closing thoughts. I think Krishna Shastri, if you recall, you mentioned uh, what I noted, four points I noted. Global threat intelligence platform, uh, platform for, share, for sharing of expertise, uh, capacity building, as well as analytics. And I'll, I'll base my comments on this. And my comments would be on what are we doing to build, answer these questions which Krishna Shastri has raised. And that's probably the way to go forward. What can be done and what is being done? Uh, first of all, let me say the topic of today's discussion, cryptocurrencies, dark web, cognitive networks, terrorism, financing, and financial thoughts probably reflects uh, one of the most pertinent topics, which is bothering, I would say, majority of our Interpol member countries, that is 194. All of them, um, or majority of them are struggling with these issues. The executive directorate, uh, that is of technology and innovation, which I had in Interpol, is working hard to build capacity of our member countries to tackle these issues. And some of these works, which uh, I would categorize in terms of what uh, Krishna Shastri used uh, are in those uh, direction and I'll just quickly go through them. First of all, we have, we, with regard to building the capability of our member countries, we have recently brought out an investigation manual called Capacity to provide a step-by-step -step assistance to law enforcement, uh, country, uh, uh, law enforcement personnel who are investigating in darknet and virtual assets with a special focus on counter-terrorism practitioners. This manual, among other things, provides basic concepts, techniques, and procedures. How can law enforcement personnel prepare for conducting investigations? What precautions and what safeguards they should do? And also includes uh, guidelines, for example, for seizure of uh, virtual assets, etc. Then we have also created a working group on dark web and virtual assets for law enforcement in collaboration with the uh, uh, private sector and academia. The focus of this working group is sharing best practices related to methodologies, practices, and tools in order to de-anonymize criminal actors who are working from dark, dark web, as well as using virtual assets for laundering the proceeds of crime, as well as financing their operations, and also to establish innovative investigative standards and deliver forensic solutions. In fact, the fourth meeting of this group started yesterday and is continuing today. And we have over 260 participants from 56 countries in this uh, meeting today, which is happening. Then we are supporting investigations in our member countries uh, uh, with tools which have been jointly developed by Interpol in association with Austrian Institute of Technology, TNO, the Netherlands-based research organization, as well as Nanyang Technological University. The, tools include dark web monitor as well as GraphSense, which is a, a, a cryptocurrency analytics tool. 
Besides works on this, uh, we are also working with Unicri to develop a toolkit for responsible use of artificial intelligence for law enforcement. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Azani mentioned, briefly mentioned about drones also, so I, uh, which is kind of an unknown commodity for law enforcement personnel. So uh, the cyber and new technology lab in, the, in my executive directorate of uh, technology and innovation has developed guidelines and procedures for conducting drone forensics. So what happens once a drone is seized? So we have also prepared guidelines for the first responders to any drone incident. And then once we have secured the evidence, what can be done to, uh, uh, to extract evidence out of these drones? So we have established procedures which we are sharing with our member countries. And with regard to the uh, financial, uh, tracking financial uh, flows, we have created a task force recently, which will be looking at financial force in order to track the proceeds of crime. These are some of the initiatives being taken by Interpol with regard to this. Uh, I, in addition, I, I, I forgot to mention that we have also created a secure collaboration platform for operational purposes to exchange uh, pieces of intelligence among interested member countries. And on the same lines, we have also created another secure collaboration platform, which we are calling as Global Knowledge Hub, where we are basically sharing best practices, et cetera, with member countries. So they have one solution where they can look into various uh, theme-based discussion groups, best practices, et cetera, there. And as an example, let me give you one example of what Interpol has done. Uh, since last year, we had conducted a year-long operation and uh, we came out with the results last week. So in this year-long operation coordinated in different member countries, there were 35 countries involved, 21,549 arrests have been made, 10,380 locations were raided, 310 bank accounts were frozen, and US dollars 150 million have been uh, intercepted. These, all these things were coming out of telecom and social engineering frauds, and all this has been enabled by this kind of information sharing as well as uh, helping member countries to build their capacity. And lastly, I'll just like to mention that we have started the work on establishing the uh, project which we call Insight, which is an artificial intelligence-based analytics uh, platform which we will be sharing with our member country. We intend to uh, make it available before the end of 2021. So this is uh, what we are doing with, uh, with regard to our efforts in this area. And I'll be happy to any, uh, answer any questions in this regard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oberoi. Uh, this was a very reassuring speech that you gave us. Certainly, we are all going to sleep better after having heard you speak today. I uh, a lot of points that were uh, that were very pertinent. Thank you again. And now I would request Dr. Shlomit Bagman to please come and give us his talk. Dr. Shlomit Bagman is the Director General of Israel's Money Laundering and Terror Financing Prohibitory Authority, the IMPA, uh, at the Israeli Financial in Intelligence Unit. She is the she's heading the Israeli delegation of the FATF, Manival, and Egmont. She joined IMPA as its general counsel after working with law firms uh, in the USA and Israel. She served as an adjunct lecturer at Tel Aviv University, Bar Ilan University, and the Interdisciplinary Center was a and was a fellow at the Information Society Project at Yale Law School. She has also edited the book called Sion Cybercrime with Professor Jack Balkin. Uh, Dr. Shlomit Wackman, I think yours is a very, very much anticipated speech. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, this morning. Um, and thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. 
Um, I will speak now on the financial aspects on terrorism financing, uh, in particular about crypto assets, uh, or as we call it, virtual assets, which uh, has been chosen to be the global name for this phenomena. Uh, so uh, for um, my lecture, my section, we'll use the term uh, virtual assets, and that it includes basically all crypto assets and all related activity. Uh, the focus of my presentation will speak about the financing elements because in order to conduct uh, terror activity and especially in order to go to the uh, virtual worlds, you have to have the connection to fi fiat money and um, um, local uh, economy. Uh, those are efforts that both Israel and India are part of uh, as their membership at the FATF, which is a global uh, um, standard setting uh, organization. Uh, this is the organization that actually sets the standards that uh, all countries must comply with. Uh, and we have very good connection with the India delegation to the FATF. What uh, I will discuss now in the following minutes basically reflects uh, our experience in Israel, but also the international experience and uh, what are the standards, uh, the global standards on virtual assets. Um, so, of course, there is a close, we've, we've all seen the, the close connection between virtual assets and terrorism financing. Uh, and we'll try to explore a little bit what the FATF has done with that, what Israel has done, and what other places are related uh, to that. So, of course, virtual assets, there are a lot of promises and also problems. Promises, and this is something that we should all remember. Here we are at the law enforcement uh, orientation, uh, but still there are a lot of promises in this field and we see that there is a legitimate uh, purpose and use of those assets. It's uh, enhanced financial inclusion. Uh, it it uh, allows to uh, lower transactions cost, increase competition in financial services and give better services to the public and advance the technological solution for global trade. But then of course we have uh, the disadvantages for us as law enforcement uh, community. Um, the anonymity and the cash-like uh, characteristics of uh, the virtual assets. The fact that there are no borders, everything is actually cross-border. And many times in our world, um, cross-border are actions of higher risk in terms of financing uh, of terrorism uh, activity. We don't have regulated uh, intermediates. And uh, we also have a lot of challenges in freezing, seizing, and confiscating uh, the assets. The solution is uh, FIU's law enforcement authorities uh, around the globe uh, realize that is to do AML, anti-money laundering, and anti-terrorism financing by design, namely to create an environment that allows us to track the relevant transactions and provide better and safer um, 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 uh, uh, environment uh, for that. So as we've seen here in Lent, uh, indeed, uh, terrorist financing is being held with virtual assets and we need to see how to solve it. In order to solve it, the FATF, the Financial Action, the Financial Action Task Force, has drafted uh, some guidelines and, uh, and rules that all countries and territories and jurisdictions around the globe must comply with. This is not dis discretionary, it's not an option. All countries must apply uh, the model that I will uh, uh, present now. Um, just to take a step back, because I'm not sure that everyone here uh, is familiar with the financial investigation and FINIT, financial intelligence um, aspects. Uh, in every country, there is a unit uh, that's called FIU, FIU, Financial Intelligence Unit. In Israel, this is us, IMPA. Uh, in India, there is a, 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 this unit as well, and all in all countries. Each FIU receives reports from the uh, private sector in its country. Uh, it should analyze those uh, FIUs, those uh, reports, um, and check them and transfer relevant uh, suspicious activities to law enforcement authorities in order to further uh, conduct investigation and seize the funds. Uh, in Israel, IMPA is a very prominent and leading um, 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 player in the law, uh, in the uh, law enforcement environment. Um, and we are also leading in the international sphere uh, in those issues. So when we got to this reality of virtual assets, together uh, with the FATF and all member countries, 
we've realized that we need to impose the standards that are uh, relevant to the old or to the traditional economy also to uh, this sphere. And here the rules are kind of uh, uh, simple, simple to say, not to uh, um, apply. We'll see it in a minute. So VASP, VASP, it means Virtual Assets Service Providers, um, the, the, uh, the platforms that are providing uh, the services uh, of exchange uh, and uh, allows us to work in uh, the Virtual Assets platform. The entire package of obligations that are imposed on traditional financial institutions should apply on them as well. So it means that every uh, crypto uh, exchange, every MSB money service provider that deals with virtual assets must to comply to those standards. Um, they have to be registered or licensed and supervised for compliance. Each one of them has to be able to conduct know your customer to the clients that are purchasing uh, the virtual assets and to be able to monitor the activity and when they uh, are viewing uh, suspicious activities to money laundering or terrorism financing, they must report to the relevant regulator, to the relevant FIU, Financial Intelligence Unit, in their jurisdiction. Um, so by conducting this package, um, we want to create a safer environment. Namely, it means that every platform must be registered or licensed in one of the jurisdictions around the globe. And if they are not uh, registered or licensed and supervised, then it's very obvious that they are at the black areas, which gives us law enforcement authorities better tools to handle the risk and to know who's legitimate and who's less. Uh, legitimate and then also to target our efforts in uh, identifying and, uh, and uh, focus on the less uh, legitimate uh, platform. Um, in order to make sure that the FATF standards, um, I mean the reporting regime that applies to all traditional uh, economy will be effective on virtual assets as well, the FATF has decided to conduct a specific adjustment for virtual assets, namely the customer due diligence process must be uh, take uh, place at a lower threshold at about 1000 US dollars or euros um, for occasional transactions because we understand that uh, transaction in virtual assets are of uh, smaller amounts many times and that it's very easy to transfer sums on smaller amount. But when they're getting to a higher amount and the threshold is $1,000 or more, we want to make sure that they are monitored and that we have all the details that are related to them. And then the additional uh, um, um, uh, requirements that the FATF is asking is the travel rule. And this is a very, very challenging uh, uh, requirement. Basically, it means that every VASP, as every virtual asset service provider must comply with the FATF wire transfer rules, similar to uh, SWIFT rules, when you have the details of the originator and the receptor of the amounts on both sides. I know that to most of you, it sounds dramatic, how the hell can we do that within the virtual asset environment? And yet uh, the world is uh, going towards this, uh, um, this direction. And I explain a little bit later how it works. But within a couple of years, it will be very clear that you are either co in compliance with the FATF standard as a platform for crypto, or you are not in compliance. When you are in compliance, you can provide as a virtual assets uh, service provider, you provide uh, the um, relevant law enforcement authority, the information that they need in, all, in order to trace uh, terrorism financing and money laundering activity. And if you are not uh, registered and regulated and co in compliance with all those rules, then we could uh, come and attack the platform as a whole or to, uh, and this is even more important to make sure that other platforms will not uh, uh, have any appetite to conduct business with that platform or with virtual assets that have passed through those platforms. And in those days, it's very easy to locate, uh, uh, to track uh, the transactions and where they were. So whenever we have any um, 
um, any um, um, uh, event in which you met such platform, then the entire trail will be black and uh, therefore not welcome in, in legitimate financial institutions. So the, the FATF standards on, for virtual assets uh, have a very broad definition of what virtual assets is. Uh, and we are really keeping that as the technology uh, neutral. We are not talking about either Bitcoin or Litecoin or, or uh, Zcash. We are talking about the principles and that's what matters. The regulation is on, as I mentioned, virtual asset service providers. And as a result, the entire uh, system will be impacted by that, the economical system. Um, they also have to assess and mitigate the risk and uh, they need to uh, apply the, uh, uh, the travel rule as in other uh, aspects. The FATF, um, I'm, I'm sorry, but I haven't mentioned that, but uh, in addition to my role as uh, the head of the Israeli Financial Intelligence Unit at the Israeli government, I'm also chairing the operative uh, uh, committee at the FATF, the RTMG Working Group, which is, have uh, prepared a uh, substantial part of those uh, global documents that are uh, and obligatory to other countries. So the FATF uh, have provided a lot of work and uh, the documents that you can see here are uh, available online and some of them are, uh, are um, uh, accessible only to law enforcement community and some of them are to the global public with red flags, uh, indicators and virtual assets uh, um, um, case studies and a lot of information and how, how to uh, identify and how to act on those uh, issues. Uh, and we are doing from time to time, we're doing a review to make sure that we are actually on point and that we are heading the right direction. So what are the red flag indicators that we're dealing with? Uh, few examples that we have noticed uh, in recent years. First, we have, uh, um, I mean, the, the, I'll just take a step back. The virtual assets red flag indicators are reflecting to financial institutions when they need to report to the local FAU. Uh, and it applies both to traditional financial institutions or the virtual assets uh, service providers, the platforms uh, for the, uh, the crypto uh, assets. So uh, one area of uh, to focus is in the size and frequency of the transaction. Uh, here we see that uh, when uh, the platform is seeing that there is a structuring of transaction in small amounts and under the record keeping or reporting threshold. So, I mean, it's smurfing in the virtual assets when you're doing many small uh, activities and you're trying to accumulate them to a large sum. When you're making multiple high value transaction or transfer funds immediately to multiple virtual asset service provider, including those registered or operated in other countries. We're also looking at transaction patterns that are irregular, unusual, or uncommon. And uh, that can indicate that there is a criminal activities behind them or terrorism activity behind them. For example, incoming transactions from many unrelated wallets in relatively small amounts accumulated uh, of funds uh, with uh, subsequent transfer to another wallet or full exchange for fiat currency. Uh, we also see uh, conduction of uh, virtual assets uh, and fiat currency exchange at a potential loss uh, when the value of the virtual assets uh, is, is getting higher or, or uh, uh, smaller. Then we see a lot of activities around that in order to launder uh, sums or to uh, uh, find um, um, uh, semi-legitimate uh, source for the earns or for the losses, which is also something that uh, is a channel to uh, um, transfer value among services. We're also looking at the center or the recipient uh, that might suggest criminal activity, uh, irregular, uh, ir irregularities during uh, account creation, so that creation different accounts under different names on transaction initiated from IP addresses from sanctioned juris jurisdictions. We also look at the source of the funds of, of wealth related to criminals activities. Uh, when I'm saying criminal activities, of course, all, all related also to terrorism financing, uh, such as the illicit uh, trafficking in narcotics or, uh, or dark, dark net marketplace, online gambling or other fraud, uh, fraudential initial coin offering. 
Um, we're also looking, and this is especially relevant to terrorism financing on ge geographical risk. Criminal can exploit countries with weak or absent national measure to detect, prevent, and punish money laundering and terrorist financing uh, regarding virtual assets. And we are seeing more and more activities that is being channeled to those jurisdictions with less uh, uh, requirement. Uh, this is something that we expected to see because as the FATF is putting on its standards uh, and is, is requiring country to uh, impose the, the regulation, we see that more activity is being channeled to other jurisdictions with less supervision and ability to monitor that. As, uh, and, and I'll switch to another uh, view of, of the topic as um, intelligence uh, agency. Uh, we at IMPA, as an intelligence agency, see a lot of value in OSINT uh, in order to counter terrorism financing in the virtual assets world. First, the fact that the information about virtual assets activities is available on the uh, open net. Uh, it can be shared in a broad international forum. We don't have here the problem that we many times have about um, intelligence materials that we cannot share, that this is complicated to exchange information because every entity, every law enforcement uh, um, agency can uh, have the ability to review it themselves once you give them the lead. And there's a lot of private sector um, 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 initiatives that can provide us with the tools. Uh, Chain Analysis is one of uh, the leading companies that can uh, help you uh, to uh, unreveal the activities and there are many others. There is no promotion to one or another, but there are a lot of uh, uh, companies in the field. You are not losing any data in the declassification process and uh, the receivers can verify the source and, and, and the investigated uh, and, and further investigated that because everything is available out there uh, and open. We are using, for example, telegram channels, telephone numbers, bank accounts, detail, PayPal address, Twitter IDs, website address, Bitcoin addresses. So we're looking at all these open source information and we're using that in order to analyze and trace uh, relevant uh, information uh, that is being uh, relevant to, uh, to that and it allows us also to share this information uh, very openly. Uh, when speaking about emerging trends uh, in the field, uh, so uh, indeed uh, this is a global uh, review, review uh, of emerging trends as uh, came up from the FATF uh, uh, review that was uh, conducted recently. We, saw a lot, we see a lot of use of the, of the VAST uh, that are registered or operated in jurisdiction with, uh, uh, without uh, regulation in the field of virtual assets. Uh, we see uh, the use of multiple virtual assets exchange, both local and overseas, and uh, jumping between uh, those platforms. We see immediate transfer of virtual assets to a uh, virtual asset service provider that is registered or operated overseas, and uh, continued use of tools and methods to increase anonymity of transaction. Uh, when we see that, we know that there is a reason to suspect <coughs> and conduct uh, additional uh, actions from our side. Dr. Wagman, I would ask you to please uh, wind up. Okay, so could to conclude. Bit, uh, going over the time, that's why. Uh, so just to conclude, FIUs, we have a lot of information that related to those activities um, and um, I'll conclude here, that's fine. Dr. Wagner, thank you. And uh, about the working of the FIUs, I think it would be really useful if we could have some workshops between India and Israel with you heading that, because I think our, uh, our security forces, our intelligence forces and the local police would, be, uh, would, would, would benefit a great deal by this. Uh, thank you all again and uh, uh, request uh, audience to give some, to put in the questions. Uh, would request the audience to either, yes, raise their hands. I can hear, I can see now Mr. Kedar, Kedar Kulkarni. Uh, yes, yeah. Mr. Kedar Kulkarni, could you please uh, put, in your, put in your question? Yeah. Make it short though and only to the point. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much for such an elaborate uh, session. And it's glad to know that uh, we have standards for uh, cryptocurrencies as well. Uh, my question is uh, whether standards are being set for private sector companies as well. 
given the fact that these hackers or uh, these uh, criminals are looking at some weak links like dr krishna shastri pointed out that how a bank in india was uh, hijacked through the ransomware uh, that was pointed out to some uh, old softwares which were being used thus they could exploit the vulnerability so are there any standards being set for private companies uh, like it's always a cat and mouse game but uh, still is there any work been done for uh, these private sector companies who are the means for this uh, cryptocurrencies yeah, thank you can i answer that question yes please uh, i think uh, i forgot the name of the gentleman who has asked this question amisha kedar right mr kedar uh, yes kedar if you look at is uh, the reserve bank of india is a regulator and whatever they propose it is going to be varied for individual to that of the private organization to the government organizations please make it point second thing is it's very clear in india you can have a bitcoin so having a bitcoins is not at all a crime only recently the issue has come up is something called as remember regulation of the bitcoin exchanges that's what they are going to look at it because as you rightly mentioned by uh, dr stromit uh, currently the regulation of the bitcoins is not at all there that's where we are supposed to look at with the help of remember the law enforcement agencies like today we are having a lot of non banking finance institutions that are existing but as per the law everybody is supposed to register but many of them are doing a illegal practices so if at are you are having a very good number practice where everybody should get registered then you have enough data with you you can identify and you can track it from which place to which place the money is going etc so who is making the transactions same as like a routine case right we to have a very good number fiu is going to monitor it, the monetary transactions you are making it we know very well anything if you want to make a transaction more than 40000 rupees you are supposed to provide a number in the form of a cash you should provide your pan number otherwise the red flag is going to get generated at all but people have identified the ways and means etc like a spurfing you are having it where 10000 10000 you will transfer so that the red flag will not get generated okay so currently the regulations are very strong but there are a lot of illegal way of remember people are exchanging these bitcoins thank you so much sir um mr giridhar mamidi please hello yeah uh, sorry can I, uh, yeah can you hear me yes, yes we can hear you yeah yeah uh, so um, my question is about uh, the fatf um, we have seen that fatf is vulnerable to um, what do you say political interference as was the case with pakistan recently um, uh, you know um, while the purpose is to track the terror funding uh, for the past few years we have seen that uh, fatf has actually not gone after they could not really impose any penal actions against uh, countries or organizations uh, which were uh, uh, you know funding the t t terror uh, operations like um, with the pressure from china turkey and uh, probably malaysia or somebody Uh, pakistan still continues to be in the gray list but it is not moving into the black list so isn't this a concern isn't it that fatf has probably not lived up to what it was meant to be uh, the top level real uh, terror funding uh, countries are getting away with blood whereas um, you know um, the probably uh, probably the smaller countries or smaller organizations are uh, you know probably targeted Uh, is that the case or uh, do we do anything else to really curb uh, the terror funding from fatf perspective um i guess that uh, the question was uh, referred to me uh, yeah, i'll yeah. try yeah, yeah i'll try to answer I, i just want to highlight that i'm not answering on behalf of the fatf <laughs> but on 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 my own and uh, that was a very broad question and actually the fatf is now uh, sitting and and talking about the strategic uh, plan and what should be changed uh, uh, and what should be improved at the fatf effectiveness uh, globally uh, and it might be part of that discussion i will just want to highlight that the fatf does not sanction a particular organization a terror organization group but it ref uh, uh, it looks at countries and there is a certain processes that on one hand 
hand uh, made to be the, the stick and on the other side meant to be the carrot. And the, the process of the FATF, namely the RCRG process in which Pakistan is now uh, uh, on the gray list is, is very structured in terms of what the process is. You're first going through your mutual evaluation uh, on the country, then you're getting into the, um, uh, the gray list and then you get an, an action plan. If you're not in compliance with the action plan, then you're going to the, uh, to the black list. So, Pakistan is in the process of that uh, issue. There are a lot of concerns around the globe about the, fa the fact that uh, the FATF is not fast enough, uh, but that uh, comes from, uh, and, and actually I'm, uh, Israel is one of the, the, the countries that believe that the FATF should, should act uh, um, um, quickly, uh, more quickly and uh, to be more uh, rapid in its responses. But on the other hand, the majority of, of countries thinking that this is a process that has, must have carrots for countries in order to get cooperation and collaboration and in order to make them uh, change and improve their regime. Uh, so with that respect, it takes a lot of time. I could just share with you that uh, in terms of, let's say, Iran, that was, on, uh, uh, that was removed from the double blacklist uh, for a lot of time, uh, Israel, and uh, I think that India were the same uh, side of, uh, of uh, the platform that we argued that the process is too slow and it should be more uh, fast in order to be more effective, but um, um, the decisions are being taken by the consensus for countries and we were not able to make it faster. At this point, Iran, for example, is uh, indeed on the double blacklist. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Apurva, Apurva Misha, please. Yeah, uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, congratulations to all the four presenters. It was an excellent uh, discussion. Uh, all of you highlighted the challenge of uh, unregulated cryptocurrencies being used by terrorist organizations. Given this background, my question is to all four of you. Last year, Facebook announced that it's coming up with its own cryptocurrency, the Libra. And uh, once it was announced, there was a very strong pushback from the American government and from governments around the world that it should not be allowed to launch its own cryptocurrency. But from a long-term perspective, don't you think that for policymakers, it's better that entities like Facebook, Amazon, which are otherwise very heavily regulated under, under laws around the, around the globe, they should be allowed to enter into this market so that genuine users of cryptocurrency can avail their services while uh, you know criminal elements are forbidden from using those services because those entities will otherwise be kept checked by governments around the world so from a long term perspective do you think that it's better to have this approach of allowing entities like amazon facebook to enter the cryptocurrency market I'll be happy to take that and very short uh, as a regulator uh, myself. Um, indeed, I think that uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, the, the approach is yes, of course, they can do those activities. However, they have to do it safely, namely under the international standards of, uh, uh, of the FATF and how to monitor transactions in the market. Once the FATF introduces its approach and apply the regime on uh, the virtual asset platform, uh, then we saw the uh, drawback uh, of those companies, namely because uh, they did not plan to comply with those standards. Mm -hmm. Once they will be in compliance, of course, they could be the perfect fit uh, for that. But uh, I think that that was the chilling effect on them because they wanted to do it faster and without the required balances and monitoring and KYC that is required uh, in other platforms. Dr. Azani, do you have some thoughts on that? Yes, I can add to this uh, topic uh, from my point of view, meaning from the jihadist point of view. Uh, the idea behind uh, different cryptocurrency, it doesn't uh, important things in the eye of the uh, radical Islamist global jihadist because they need to use this, this currency. For them, the source is not uh, important. For them, if they will be able to exploit it, the system and delivering money from one place to the other place, it could be Amazon, it could be Facebook, it could be Twitter, it doesn't matter. It could be Bitcoin on the other side. So you need to bear in your mind that the other side, meaning the enemies, they want to have the money and to move the money quickly. If the platform allow them, Although the platform is going to be operated and being compliant to FATA issues and others, but if the, the uh, platform allow them and it's anonymous, they will use it through, let's say, for instance, charities. 
through people that are not really uh, directly connected to the organization, they deliver this kind of money through criminals. So they will find, you know, the, the places, the gaps that enable them to deliver uh, this kind of money from one place to the other place. And what uh, uh, Dr. Shlomit said, and it, I am uh, totally accept it, we need to build this kind of, uh, you know, international uh, uh, concept and uh, operation to counter all these uh, 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 virtual currency uh, efforts, because at the end of the day is international cooperation. Thank you. Thank you all our distinguished panelists. Uh, it has been a very educative uh, session. It has been a session which I have personally learned a lot and I hope that most of our audience would have also learned a lot. Uh, we have a little bit transgressed our time, but I think it was absolutely worth it given the quality of the lectures that we have had. So on behalf of India Foundation, thank you again over to Soumya.